I am a storyteller. <laughs> storyteller. Now I say storyteller instead of liar, cause there's a heap of difference between a storyteller and a liar. <laughs> a liar, that's somebody taking cover things over. <laughs> Mainly for his own private benefit. But you're storytelling now. <clears throat> That's somebody what you're taking. Uncover things. So everybody can get some good out of it. Now, just when I thought I was building a house, turns out I was building a man and a heart in heaven. Each renovated room, flesh and bone, spirit and blood, thirsty for a future and a past in my present. There's somewhere in between having and having not. But I guess that's the story now. Most colored folk who consider other cities when New Orleans is enough. Or is it? Well, now, now, now what y'all say y'all come here to build again? What y'all say y'all come here to do? Oh, you come to remember. But now how far back you willing to go? You willing to go like, like levee building, like canal digging, swamp treading, river swimming, grand maroon ancestor bubbling through the concrete where sewage and water board can't hold us back, kind of back, or just like, oh yeah. I went down there for Mardi Gras one year, got sloppy, drunk on Bourbon Street, pissed everywhere, threw up all over. Now look, do you know the filth we have had to walk through? What we have had to wash? Do you know how much doesn't come out, no matter the amount of water you use, how forceful you scrub? It's just in the cracks, in the crevices, in the intricate parts, becomes DNA, permanent memory, and you, and you, it becomes you, you, careful where you tread. Even the asphalt is ancestral. Now, now tell me again, what you say y'all come to build? What, what is it really that you came to be? Oh, you came to be remembered. But now tell me, how far back really are you willing to go?
planets living things holding memory and mystery healing flesh and rock carving veins and mountainsides water is the great collector down to the molecular level a somehow stable congregation of charged particles positive and negative held together by polarity as cells of an ever decaying ever regenerating body this polarity makes the molecules thirsty makes them suck in salt and strip it down for parts, holding sodium and chloride apart, limbs bound, tongues cut out, bouncing and bobbing in darkness between charges through the vast glass fabric of the sea until they come to find again their familiar chemistry on the shores of some land they never imagined, restored by the light of the sun. Sounds barbaric, but do not hold this behavior against your mother. It is not her fault, only her nature. She must take and hold what comes to her and does not cut its way by gravity to the ground. She can be so nourishing, exalting what little things we make and are, her body a museum, a lost and found, here a bottle, there a hollow log, particles, pebbles, shipping vessels, messages, memory. Ooh. Mm-hmm. 
This was the night I selected to start on my journey to that free land of Canada, which I knew was somewhere under the North Star. About 10 o'clock at night, I selected the swiftest mule on the plantation and started for Lake Providence, which is about 90 miles northeast of Monroe and situated on the Mississippi River. The mule traveled like a deer for more than four hours, and it must have been very near three o'clock in the morning, for the roosters were crowing, and the old mule changed his mind. All at once he stopped, and I kept straight on over his head for about 10 feet and landed on my stomach in six inches of mud and water. When I regained my footing, he was standing just where I had left him when I went over his head. I again climbed on to his back and told him to go ahead, but he never moved no more than if he had been a dead mule. I patted him on the neck a while, and then again urged him to go ahead, and he turned around and looked me in the face as if to say, I know just what you are doing. You are running away. And all at once he turned around in a perfect circle for about five minutes, and then started like the wind. Dear reader, you cannot even imagine what a predicament I was in. To return to my cabin before the blowing of the horn was impossible, for I was more than 30 miles away. It was Fallon's edict that every slave that failed to form in line 10 minutes after the sounding of the horn at 4 o'clock should receive 100 lashes. My clothing was completely saturated with mud and water, which made me look more like a big mud turtle than a human being. I was in a land where every white man was a Negro catcher, and every black man was worth his weight in gold. But something was to be done, and at once, for the rain had ceased to fall and the clouds were scattering in every direction, and by the morning star that was slowly moving up the horizon, I knew day was breaking. I left the highway and waded through mud and swampland until I reached the dense forest and then continued my journey for a mile or two back in the forest and climbed a cypress tree. The fringe on a cypress tree is sufficient to make it impossible to discover a man except by close observation after he has climbed 25 or 30 feet from the ground. I was not afraid of being captured that day unless by mere accident, for I was satisfied that the rain had not only made it impossible for the hounds to follow my trail, but it had also erased my footprints on the main highway. I selected the forks of a tree and lashed myself to the limbs with cypress bark and was soon fast asleep. In my dreams, I was again with my father and mother in my log cabin way up in old Virginia. During the day, I remained in my hiding place and I was greatly refreshed by my day's rest and the dry atmosphere had completely dried my clothing and it was an easy matter for me to rid my clothing of the greater part of the mud and dirt by pounding and shaking them. I refilled my water bottle and started on my journey toward the town of Lake Providence, but my progress was very slow, as well as irksome, for I was compelled to keep clear of the highway and traveled across fields and swamps that were filled with insects and poisonous serpents. Compelled to travel under the cover of darkness, with no guide except the Mississippi River and no light but the North Star, you who live in palaces and sleep in a feather bed can never imagine the hardships of the man who is traveling through mud and swamps in the dead hours of night with no shelter but the canopy of heaven and was startled at the rustle of every leaf and the chirping of every cricket seemed to cry out, stop him, there he goes, and imagine he could hear voices whispering in the still midnight air. I was unaware of the vigilance kept along the banks of the Mississippi River between Vicksburg and Memphis for the capture of runaway slaves. I was not aware that both sides of the river was being patrolled night and day by those who made their livelihood by capturing escaped slaves and thereby securing the rewards, which were frequently as high as $500 if captured alive and one half that sum for their dead bodies. I did not know that bloodhounds were let loose at all the accessible places of crossing in order to scent the tracks of anyone who might have crossed the river during the night unobserved. But I was soon made aware of these facts. About nine o'clock in the morning, 
while snugly perched in the forks of a tree, I heard the old familiar howl of hounds. And although the sound was a long distance from me, yet I was sure a human being was being pursued. But whether it was myself or someone else, I was not able to determine. Bloodhounds are not fleet until within a few rods of their game. About five miles an hour is their ordinary gait when following a cold trail, or when their game is two or three miles ahead of them. But as they draw nearer, they double their speed, and they never tire and are as unerring as time itself. I have known them to follow a trail for five consecutive days and win their game. The owners of them generally follow on horseback and about a mile in the rear. About ten minutes after hearing the first echoes of their howls, it was repeated, but was much nearer and more distinct. And then I knew that it was myself that was being pursued, and I determined to foil them if possible. I at once left my hiding place and started for the river, which was about a mile away. And when having run about two-thirds of the distance, they gave me another one of their terrible warnings that they were not more than a half mile behind me. The thoughts of freedom and the dread of Dick Fallon renewed my energy and doubled my speed in my superhuman efforts to reach the river. It was a race against time, a run for my life. I knew that if I could reach the river, it was possible to elude them by wading into the water along the bank and then retracing a few miles of my journey. The cane brake and underbrush that grew along the banks would conceal me, and the water would cover my trail. But it was a task beyond human strength and human speed to execute, for as I neared the river, the ground would not bear my weight only by slow and cautious tread. I was wading in six inches of mud and water, and the bogs and mounds were trembling and sinking beneath my feet, and another tremendous howl from a score of those pursuing man-eaters made my blood run cold. For they were not more than one hundred rods behind me, while twice that distance must be traveled ere I could reach the river. It was sure death for me to be run down by that swarm of hunting tigers, for the men on horseback were perhaps a mile away, and I knew I would be torn limb from limb before they could possibly arrive. Reader, picture the scene, if possible, of a man running for his life, and a score of mad hounds pursuing him to drink his blood. There were no chasms, no cliffs, no places of concealment, no possible chance of escape, except by reaching that cypress tree and ascending beyond their reach ere they came sweeping down upon me. It was a crisis of my life, and although it happened nearly 50 years ago, yet it startles me, even now, in my old age. Buried Alive, William Walker, 1892. In the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water that's going to trouble the water. Wait. In the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, that's gonna trouble the water. I remember the sound. 
the waves crashing against the cradle of my childhood, flooding my empty spaces, a cleansing, a massacre. Did she, did she tell you I made it? I often lie and say I lived through it, but there are so many pieces of me I left back there. Did you see my blood in the water? Flow thick like skin required of the melanated ones. The nappy headed, it was, it was red like mama's eyes but there no more tears left. Said I love you like she was unsure of return, unsure of breath or life. There is no comfort here. Did you see my blood in the water? See what has become of me. See how my memories drowned like black bodies jumping from slave ships, drowning in concrete jungles, dodging extinction, ducking erasure, wondering if the next moment is promised or stolen. Do you remember the sounds? The soul sucked from screaming survivors standing in the warmth of sun. Only death awaits the neglected the downtrodden, the overlooked and forgotten, the fatherless ones claiming only half ourselves when the only place you can go is the same space you lost everything, how can you find peace? It is so lonely here. Inside the love that desperation forces into hiding. In a room where too much has happened. In a life where too much has happened. When blood is our story what songs do we sing? When every day we are a bullet away from drowning, a chokehold's reach from death, hashtags waiting our every breath, when every word must conjure, will you write us back above the water? Will you seed and vow to bloom new truth? Will you write us a righteous eruption? For we are not the face this America masks us with. We are not the, the words or sounds given. We are not the broken souls they attempt to bleed, stumbling through simplicity and greed, through prejudice and pain, through suicide and quicksand, from village to borough to block. If your voice, if your voice could overwhelm the waters, what would it say to sons and daughters searching the tidelines for bottled messages from sunken slave ships? When you saw everything, everything be taken away, and you had nothing more to give, they take aim at your memories. And the pieces begin to go missing. And the music begins to go silent. And the feet begin to go still, but it is then, it is then you must find new meaning in the moments. Like the hint of sun rays that bring forth the morning, we are awoken, reborn, and baptized, undefined, unstandardized. They will stare at your blackness, at your brilliance, at your heaven and your hells, culture rising from deep within your bones, deep inside your exposed walls. Nothing can hold you, conform or contain. You, you who pound feet into the ground, you architect of feather and crown, you who dare to make sounds with, with, with with words and music, with magic and movement, you, maker of life, basking in ancestral breath, dive back, dive back into the woods and scrub our city black. For the ancestors, for the children, for the water. For our relationship with water. When them children leave the water on. For the love of the water. Yeah, nah, I see.